Hey guys, it's Robin R. Silent Crafts and welcome to my craft room. Right now, many of us are wearing masks when we go out into public for our safety and for the safety of those around us. And we're not used to wearing masks. And even those that are in the medical field, the heroes, the ones that are police officers and firefighters and anyone in the medical field that is putting in all that extra time and work to keep us safe and to keep us healthy, they do wear masks throughout the day, but they don't wear them all the time like they are right now. So many of them are wearing them for 12 hours or more. And the problem with that is the elastics can become very sore behind your ears. If you've been wearing yours for any amount of time like I have, you know just a quick trip up to the grocery store and it can be very uncomfortable on your ears. They can cause a chafing and they can cause sores and it tends to make people touch their face and touch their mask more because it's uncomfortable. You're always trying to adjust it. And also many of the masks that we're making, we're making them one size fits all. Now these with the rounded elastic, you can tie a knot in the elastic and whether you leave it over here or down at the bottom so it's not behind your ear or you put it back in the channel, you still have that elastic behind your ear. You can make it smaller. I found that these and different faces, they need to be a little bit smaller or they need to be a little bit larger. But if you make them as a one size fit all, it's always gonna be someone that needs something different. When I wear this mask with a seven inch elastic cut, like most of us are doing, it's just a little bit too big on my face. I find that there's a little bit of a gap here. There's a little bit of a gap up top, even though I do have the wires in here to help bend it around my nose. And of course it's a little gappy at the bottom. So we need to have something that's gonna solve all of these problems. The chafing and the pain on the ears and to also make our mask fit better. So today I'm gonna show you how to make an ear saver. This is simply some fabric with some batting and some buttons. And with this, when we wear our mask, we can put this on the back of our head. What I find is easiest for me to do is I put the mask on first, then I go ahead and I pull it over and attach it to one button. And while I'm holding on to this, I'll bring the other off of my ear and attach it that way. Now this is gonna sit at the back of your head and it's gonna take the pressure off of when it's on your head, it stays on a lot better, trust me. It takes the pressure off of your ears because this is no longer on the back of your ears. Your ear is going to be right here, so it's gonna go across the top and the bottom. And it's not gonna have that painful tightness along the side of your face as it does on your ears. And I also found that when I wear it with this mask here specifically, that it's going to tighten up these elastics that are just a little bit too long, or maybe your elastics have lost the elasticity to them and they're just a little bit loose. I found that wearing it with the ear saver that it tightened the mask up. It is now held firmly to my face. I no longer have any gapping on the sides, the top or the bottom. And I also found that it was very comfortable to wear. I did not have to constantly wanna to touch my mask or touch my face. I didn't feel like I needed to adjust anything to sit better. It was just more comfortable to wear for longer periods of time. So let me go ahead and show you how I make these. These are really quick and easy. If you've been with me for a while and we've made the bookmarks, we've made the wrist cuffs, and we've also made the coffee cozies, we are gonna make this the same exact way. So my finished ear saver measures five and a quarter inches long and one and a quarter inches high. And I find that this is just a nice size for your basic average person. As I go through the process, I'm gonna also give you some numbers for a child. If you wanna go ahead and look down below in the description, all the information is right there. Because sometimes listening to someone talk about numbers over and over again, we kind of glaze over, right? My supplies are two pieces of fabric. You can use the same fabric that you made the mask with, or if like me, you're making it afterwards, you can just go ahead and use random scraps. I went into my two inch scrap bin and I just pulled out some things that were long enough. So I cut mine at two inches by six inches. If I were making this for a smaller child, so maybe 10 years or younger, I would go ahead and cut it five inches long because their heads aren't as big as ours is, right? I also cut a piece of batting to the same measurements. So this one is cut at two inches by six inches. You can go ahead and use, if you don't have batting, you can use fusible fleece. You can use some regular fleece, some felt, just something to give it a little bit extra cushion. I went ahead and made a test design just to see how it would be with just the fabric. And I found with the fabric that I can actually feel it on the back of my head more. It was almost like the elastic from the ears. I could feel it kind of digging into my scalp a little and it felt like 
it didn't want to stay in place and it wanted to twist a lot. So when I went ahead and made one with the batting inside, just a little bit of extra cushioning, I found that it just sits across the back of my head much nicer. I'm not going to quilt these or anything. They're very small. You could add a little quilting if you want, but if you're making a bunch to either go with the mask you already made or to make them in the future, you might want to streamline it a little bit and not to go with too much. So I'm going to start out by putting my fabric right side up. This one is a little hard to tell. Sometimes I have to look at both sides to see. And then I'm going to take my next piece of fabric and I'm going to put it right sides down. You can make this sandwich any way you want. You just want to make sure your fabrics are touching right sides together. And then I'm going to put my batting on top. I could put my batting on the bottom this way and it would work the same. As I said, you just want to make sure your fabrics are touching right sides. I'm going to use a quarter inch and I'm going to stitch all the way around. My machine automatically goes to a 2.0 stitch length, but you can adjust it for your machine on however it works for you. I'm going to leave a little space about an inch and a half, two inches open on the sides here so that I can turn it out. You could leave it open on the end, but I find that I have a little bit of an issue with extra fabric and it makes it kind of hard to tuck here. So I like to go ahead and leave it on one of the long ends. I tried to use some basic just fusible interfacing. And I found while it gave the fabric some stiffness, it still didn't give it that cushion factor that I wanted. Just a little thin piece of cotton batting just gave it that little extra. You could put some old t-shirt, a piece of t-shirt in there or something like that, or sweatpants. That would give you that little extra cushioning that you're looking for. And it keeps it from being too twisted. Okay, so let's get this sewn. I'm back stitching at the beginning and the end, just so when I turn it, my stitches don't pop open. Now you can make it all fancy and pretty and cut your edges with a little bit of a curve or stitch around it, but that's fine and it looks really nice if you're just making one or two. But if you have to make 20 or 30 or even more, because some of you are making a thousand masks plus, that it's, it's, it's extra time. So if we're mass producing these, we don't want to add all that extra steps to it because it does add up and it does take more and more time to go through this. So not only would you have to stitch it, you'd have to cut it, you might have to pink the edges and all that. Now, if you find that your fabric and your batting shifted at all, you can go ahead and just trim that up. So you have about a quarter of an inch seam or a little bit less. I try, I do like to trim my corners just to get that extra bulk out. I'll trim any of the threads that are sticking anywhere because those threads always want to come and find their way back out when we flip it. Since there are no curves, I don't have to worry about clipping into any of the curves or using the pinking shears. And then we're just gonna turn it. You can give it a little press first if you want to get all those stitches just to set down and make sure everything is looking good. If I were making these, I would go ahead and assembly line and make a bunch of them at first, take them all over and press them, and then turn them all instead of doing them one at a time. You can use hemostats or another turning tool. I find if I just stick a finger in there and I grab the corners or the end of it with my thumb, I can just kind of make my hole a little small and just go ahead and turn it. If you can just push it through, however it takes to get that through, just don't force it too much because you don't want to rip any of your seams. The hemostats work really good, but sometimes, you know, you just want to grab it with your fingers. If you have your children helping or your husband or your wife, you can always let them help by turning it out. I'm using a little metal crochet hook to pop my corners out just a little bit. I'm not worried if it's a nice, sharp, perfect corner. I don't find that I need to have it exactly precise like that. I'm fine with it just being a little bit rough. Take it back over and give it a good press. I wanna make sure that I have tucked my edges in nicely so it's nice and even. Then I'm just gonna go ahead and top stitch around it to close up that hole. Here's my hole right here where I turned it, so I'm just gonna start a little bit past it. I'm gonna stitch with an eighth of an inch, thereabouts, just top stitch around to close up the hole and to give it that little bit of structure it needs. So when it goes through the washing machine, it doesn't get any twisted in any weird way.
I backstitch at the end just to lock all the stitches in so they don't come undone. There we go, we have our little rectangle. Now all we gotta do is add the buttons. Now you can go ahead and machine stitch them on. It'd probably be a really good idea if you're making dozens of these. You wanna make sure your buttons are large enough so that specifically your quarter inch flat elastic goes around it. The round corded elastic tends to fit underneath most any button. If you have a shank button, that should work also. This one I had, this button was just a little bit too thin to use. So I went ahead and I stuck another smaller button underneath it to give it a little bit of a lift to it so that it had enough room for the elastic to hook onto it. I have these buttons. These are a little bit thicker, so they will go ahead and fit through there. They look like they're about an eighth of an inch thick, so that'll be easy to hold the elastic underneath. I'm just gonna use some black embroidery floss to hold it on. You can stitch it on with regular thread. So I have these two buttons here that I'm gonna go ahead and stitch down. I'm gonna go ahead and just use some black embroidery floss to stitch it down. As I said, you can do it by machine. If you're doing a bunch of them, it might be a good idea to just set it up and do it by machine because that will hold it in there nicely. I find that the embroidery floss, because it is six strands, I use all six together, that it's nice and sturdy and it's cotton. It goes through the washer and the dryer really well because basically this is just a shirt with buttons, right? So it goes through the washer really well and it holds up nicely. We're just gonna put a couple extra knots in it to hold it. Now I just go towards the end. I leave a little bit of a space between my button and there. It doesn't have to be exact. And I'm gonna go through the top because this way I don't have a knot to bury because my knot's gonna be on the top. You might need to have a bit of a sharp needle to go through for all your batting. I'm gonna leave a little bit of a tail. This one happens to be about three inches. I'm not gonna measure it every time just to give you guys an idea. Cause I'm gonna use that to go ahead and tie it on top with the knot. So I need to have a decent amount. Put my button back on. Now I do like to go, I went down from the top, came back up. This is a four hole button. And even with a two hole, I like to go down one more time. And then back up to the top. Then I'm gonna tie a surgeon's knot. And what a surgeon's knot is, is you take your thread, just like you're gonna tie your shoes, right? You go over it once, but then you take your strand and you go back around one more time. So it's like tying your shoes twice. It's not a double knot, but you're gonna wrap it around twice. And that's gonna keep it and hold it in place. This is what they do when they're doing sutures and stuff. And then I'm just gonna tie it just like my shoes one more time. And then if you really want to be concerned about it, you want to do it one more time, I go ahead and do another one of the surgeon's knots on top. Just go around once and around twice. Make sure it's nice and tight straight from the beginning. And then you can just trim this off. I would leave at least a quarter of an inch. I wouldn't go too short. But you don't need to have big pieces flopping around if you don't want them. And there's one button nice and secure. Now it is going to have your thread on the back that's going to be on the back of their head. They're not gonna see it. If it's a concern to you, you can go ahead and use a sewing thread, maybe double up your sewing thread, or you can just go ahead and use a matching floss and it won't be a problem. So let me go ahead and stitch down another one so you can see it again. I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up just a little bit. Just make sure when you get to this point that you pull it nice and tight so that it's going to, you don't want to have a big gap that's going to be loose in between your thread and your button. 
This one is a little bit shorter than the last one, so I'm just gonna go around it twice, like tying my shoes with one extra loop around. Tie it once, and then go ahead and do the surgeon's knot again, just to make me feel better. And there you go, one ear saver. And I think the people that you make these for, if you put it in with each mask you make, that they're gonna greatly appreciate it because it's going to take all that extra pressure off of their ears. And if nothing else, it's gonna help their ears feel better. But I really feel that it just makes the mask fit just that much tighter without being uncomfortable. It, it gives you that a little bit more of a comfort feeling to it. And like I said, I did not feel like I had to constantly adjust my mask because there's no point wearing your mask if it's not gonna feel comfortable on you and you're gonna have to keep adjusting it. Thank you everyone who is making masks for your community, for those around you, and for those of you that are mailing them to other people. I think what you're doing is a wonderful thing because our heroes need all the help they can get, right? So that's it guys. I hope you make a lot of these ear savers and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.